I'd like to introduce SVLG's leader, CEO Ahmad Thomas, as he starts us off with our opening keynote conversation and our first special guest, John Hope Bryant. An American entrepreneur, author, and philanthropist, John Hope Bryant is a prominent thought leader on economic empowerment and financial dignity. He has served as an advisor to three past sitting presidents and today is the founder, chairman, and chief executive officer of Operation Hope. This should be a fascinating conversation. Enjoy. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, John. It's great to see you. Good to be seen. Honored to be with you. Thank you. We couldn't have a more timely guest given all that's going on in the world as we talk about diversity issues and where Silicon Valley is going and where the movement in Silicon Valley is going. So uh, again, truly grateful. I'm gonna dive right in. We got a lot to cover. Uh, let me start by, by giving you the mic to really hear your perspective, to set the tone here, John. And as you and I have talked, uh, many are familiar with your work and your statements. You've talked about the civil rights movement as a civil rights scholar, a scholar of the movement, and the role that corporations and commerce had played back in the 1950s and 60s, that crucial time in our country. Can you contrast that to where we are now, again, to, to set the tone for our corporations and leaders in Silicon Valley today? Sure, happy to do it. Before I say anything else though, I wanna say hello to my, all my friends in the Silicon Valley. I wanna say hello to my brother from another mother, Jed York, who is your new chairman and is a great guy. Your last chairman was also a dear friend uh, of mine, Becker and all, and Sarah Fryer from next door who's on and <clears throat> Ned from Twitter who just made a commitment uh, this morning, a chief financial officer who was incredible and Jack Dorsey and all the heroes and sheroes there in the Valley uh, who um, have made change before. This is your time. So look, we're sitting in a moment in history right now, but history doesn't feel historic when you're sitting in it. It sort of just feels like another day, but that doesn't mean the moment you're sitting in is not in fact completely historic. You know, Dr. King lived in this town that I live in now, Atlanta, Georgia, the South Coast, by the way, uh, uh, the moral capital of America, I'd argue. I think that Silicon Valley is a technology capital and LA is a creative capital and uh, Washington DC is a political capital and New York is a financial capital and Atlanta is a moral capital um, of this country. And Atlanta's proven that you can do well and do good. You can have a conversation that's about morals and money, not morals or money. And it's the right conversation, which is why we're one of the top uh, 15 uh, GDP drivers for economic growth in the country, Atlanta, Georgia, the only international city in the South, the biggest economy in the South, the most diverse economy in the South. The key plane is part of history, but Dr. King lived here in the 60s and he traveled um, six million air miles over 13 years, 2,600 speeches, just pounding it in, pounding it in, pounding it in. But it, the change didn't happen because of some glorious, big, you know, ominous moment. Uh, one speech in Washington, we are, everybody remembers, he gave that speech a hundred times before the March on Washington. Right. Uh, so much so that people were bored with it. Uh, if you think, if you go back to Washington, the, 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 that particular speech, Mahalia Jackson says off camera, off to the side, tell them about the dream, Martin. Translation, I'm tired of hearing this raggedy speech over and over again. Please riff, right? And he leaves the strip. And that's the part that people remember. But th there is something to be said for consistency and pounding it in, staying committed to your values. And, 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 and so history changed, not because of some dramatic, sexy, uh, glorious one moment, but it was a lead up of that moment of everybody leaning in and, it, and, then, and then we set it up and then the universe paid it off. Silicon Valley did that before. It was about 30 years ago when everybody said, basically Japan's gonna run the world, <laughs> throw your hands up. We've lost a GDP race in America. Everybody I knew was going to, going to learn Japanese. I mean, I know a little bit of Japanese myself. I love Japanese culture, but, but that wasn't the point. The point was people were running, they were running scared that Japan from a GDP perspective was just gonna take off. And then out of the blue came the internet and technology that was originally inspired actually by the government, a military application. 
And one thing led, led to the other, and there came the magic of Silicon Valley and GDP, literally out of nowhere, uh, that American ingenuity and freedom uh, created uh, untold growth that really transformed not only the US, but the world. Uh, it happened before that with, the, with the, uh, the civil rights movement, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute, but it also happened before that with World War II and the Marshall Plan. We won't have time to talk about that, but we sort of need a new Marshall Plan today. I've written a version of it. I've also written something that's not yet published called a third reconstruction, uh, which is where I think we're in right now for the next 10 years. And I'm hoping your, your leaders will lead that charge. So in the 60s, the perception was that the government integrated the South. That's not true. <laughs> you had Bull Connor, you had a lot of mayors and governors who actually were obstructionists. Ahmad. They were standing in those hallways and doorways saying, over my dead body. In many ways, you had, you have today versions of that going on. It was the private sector leaders uh, who integrated lunch counters at private businesses, soda shops, J uh, department stores, J.C. Penney's, Woolworths, department stores. Uh, the bus companies were privately owned back then. Uh, uh, the bus companies integrated because ultimately the color was not white, black. It was green. <laughs> it wasn't red or blue. Yeah. It was green. And the majority of the customers were black in those small towns. I mean, I, I, give, I give black folks credit for Uber and Lyft. Because when the when they when Dr. King shut and then my my mentor who lives around the corner, Andrew Young, Ambassador Andrew Young shut down the bus company because they wouldn't they didn't want to sit at the back of the bus and use the same green dollar that folks at the front of the bus were using. They said, no, thank you, no disrespect intended. We don't mean to hurt you, but we're not gonna be disrespected. And they went and got their friends to drive them around in an informal what we call black taxi system. No pun intended, black taxi mm -hmm. system. That was sort of the Uber of 1950. <laughs> we should probably get a dividend check. Uh, on being an early innovator. But that hurt the, the economy so bad, the prosecutor said, look, let, we, want, we want our economy back. And it was Andrew Young who would sh meet behind, behind closed doors with business leaders after Dr. King shut the economy down with marching, pro people, people protest. And he said, let's talk without being offensive, listen without being defensive, and always leave even your adversary with their dignity. Otherwise, spend the rest of their life trying to make you miserable. So he went without promotion, put his business suit on, cut a deal with 100 business leaders to take the whites only signs down. It was the private sector. Maybe it's not enlightened as we have today, but it was a private sector that led that charge. Last quick story. Um, uh, Dr. King won the Nobel Peace Prize, came back to Atlanta, and the business community did not want to honor him here in Atlanta. They thought it was a rebel rouser, a troublemaker. All change uh, is not all welcome. And the mayor, who did not have the power uh, of influence went to the CEO of Coca-Cola, Robert Woodruff, and said, we need your help. Robert Woodruff got the business leaders together and said, what are you guys doing? <laughs> I don't really care whether you like Dr. King or not, right? You think change is easy, right? This is one of the most important international award in the world, the Nobel Peace Prize. We're an international supply chain company. Now, if you don't want to honor this guy, we're going to move out of this backwards town and go someplace where people have got some sense. And my guess is most of you are my vendors, so I think you're going to get religion, but we'll be back. I need a decision in a week because I don't have time to mess with this. Within two weeks, the whole ballroom was sold out. And that's the image that we see on TV. Of, uh, I'm sorry, in the history books, is that the, the ballroom was sold out. Uh, people standing along the walls. But it was the business community, and specifically the CEO of Coca-Cola, who said, this is not morals or money. It's morals and money. Here's an odd thing. For the next... 50 years, black folks basically held up Coca-Cola stock <laughs> and its sales. And to this day, still drives their growth in Africa uh, because we recognize this is a company that stood for something. Um, so brand matters. And I think today you have that chance, that opportunity in the Valley to, to create history once again in this moment. This is not morals or money, it's morals and money. So I'm gonna make an economic case for you. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, well, no, let, let me try and unpack that a little bit and drill down. We got Uber and Lyft executives in, in the audience, so maybe a little follow up there. John, uh, what you said- I'm partnering with one of them, I'm, I'm, and working on the other. <laughs> <laughs> so it clearly connects with me, you know, as we shared, my family roots are, are deep in the South and Alabama. That, you know, we don't need civil rights scholars. My, my family, my dad and relatives were there on the ground. But uh, I, I wanna connect this to the audience to the, to the individuals that we've got on the line, a lot of people of color, a lot of white folks as well. Why does this matter? 
why does diversity in this conversation matter? This entire summit, 25 by 25 million black businesses, all of this work we're trying to do, why does it matter to, to us at an individual level, to everyone sure. in the audience? Sure, easy. One, you can take no pleasure from the fact that there's a hole in my end of our boat. It, or put another way, my rich friends need my poor friends to do better if only to stay rich. Put another way, we're all bound up together in this mutual fabric of mutuality, to quote Dr. King, that we are in it to win it, but uh, even the Bible says a house divided cannot stand. So only folks outside the U.S. love that we're arguing with each other about silly stuff. Uh, they, be, because they, they, they love when we are divided. We are one country. We are one people. Uh, you know, only reason I'm darker is because Africa, Africa is, it, it, the sun is direct. That's the reason that my skin is darker. Uh, that, 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 it was the sun that, di that dictated how people change. We're, we're all one people, but take this to a business, uh, even a business case, diverse companies, please listen now, diverse companies, diverse cities, diverse counties, when they're more profitable. I just mentioned Atlanta. What are the two biggest economies in the U.S.? California and New York. What's the most, two most diverse states in the U.S.? California and New York. Can't make it up. What's the biggest economy in the, U in the world? We're, there's, you know, there's only 350 million people in the U.S. The United States, 8 billion people in the world because we've got a special sauce. We're not a country, we're an idea. We can make it whoever we want. We're better together. This, the, economics, the economics prove out, I love math because it does not have an opinion, that diversity is not only just the right thing to do in inclusion, uh, it is also just smart business sense and economics. The opposite is also true. That Citigroup recently issued a report that racism against blacks alone in the last 20 years, not the last 200 years, not the last 300 years, because America is 450 years old, 300 years enslaved, 150 years free. The last 20 years of racism cost the GDP $16 trillion. That's a T, trillion. And then if we just knock it off right now and, and, and get in it to win it, we'll add a trillion dollars of GDP every year for the, at least the next five years. I think that, that, that diversity inclusion will, will create two to 3% of GDP pop in this country and for progressive countries and districts who get the memo. Well, let's talk about that GDP pop. Let's talk about what is working uh, in, in this space around diversity and inclusion. So let me ask you, uh, who, who gets it right? And obviously you get it right with the Million Black Businesses Initiative with Shopify. If you can talk about that in greater detail, because it's a blueprint that I think is helpful for us to learn from. Yeah, so once again, the private sector is leading. Last year, in the middle of, you can't, you can't make this up, six months time, the global health pandemic that rivals uh, the Spanish flu, uh, a great de a, a, re a recession on unemployment that rivals the Great Depression, uh, a social, a 400 year old social justice reckoning on Black America, uh, and a civics lesson on how really uh, unprepared we are to understand how our freedom has to be reclaimed and re-earned every day on January 6th uh, of this year, all within a six month period. Uh, coincidence is God's way of staying anonymous. I think we, that we all need a software upgrade. This is a reset moment. This is an opportunity for us to not reboot, but reset. I think the universe is giving us a chance to get the world right on our watch. And, and, I, and I think the people watching this have the unique opportunity to do so. Uh, some have stepped forward already. Last year in six months, $300 billion was committed by the private sector for social justice. That's very, very inspiring. Twitter, who's, who's on, online here, committed $100 million, Ned, Jack, to, in, in, to deposit in the minority serving institutions. They used the profit of that uh, to fund Hope Inside financial coaching locations inside of minority institutions to get the credit score up of the borrowers so that people can actually take the loans that were available at the banks to get the bank out of the no business and back into the yes business because half of black folks basically have a credit score below 620. So forget race all, uh, issues all. You can't get a loan for small business unless you have a 700 credit score. Right. Half of black folks have a credit score below 620 by no fault of our own because we never got the memo on financial literacy after the Civil War, the whole story of the Freedmen's Bank that Abraham Lincoln stood up in 1865. He was killed the month after he created it. So we, it, we're not dumb and we're not stupid. We're, when rules are published in the playing field is level, Ahmad, professional sports, as an example, and the arts, 
black folks kill it. We kill it. We we even killing tennis now. We kill, we killing F one racing. I mean, we you know we, 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 we golf. Yeah, right. Not just traditional sports, but we are never given the memo on capitalism, free enterprise, economics, ownership, opportunity, wealth creation. And you know why do you go to Harvard? I love Harvard, but why do you go to Harvard? It's easy, because the class of Harvard is going to hook each other up for the next forty years. And so if you, and convert the, the converse is also true. If you hang around nine broke people, you'll be the 10th. So you have these brilliant minds in inner cities and lowest communities who are just sort of broke people talking to broke people. There's no ladder of opportunity to go into the court from the streets to the suites. And that's why I want to talk about from civil rights, which is about race and the color line, and it was a wage and one in the streets, to silver rights, S-I-L-V-E-R, which is about class and poverty, and that's going to be wage and one in the suites. Right. The corporate suites. This is where, just by doing your job, just by doing. And by the way, I'm not. I'm not talking about hurting white people here. The the, the kind of GDP keeps creating. It keeps expanding. This, I'm talking about expanding the chair and adding a seat. Right. Expanding right. expanding the table. I'm sorry. And adding a seat. So no one loses here. By including, you actually gain new customers, new markets, new opportunities. So Walmart CEO Doug McMillan. Uh, uh, Dan Schulman of PayPal made a huge commitment. Uh, Jamie Dimon made a huge commitment. Shopify's Toby talking to him about what he could do. Uh, the largest company in, in Canada. He said, what can we do, John? I said, oh, help me create a million new black businesses. He said, mm, send me a note. I sent an email on it, a deck on a million black businesses. Crickets, didn't hear anything for a week. I said, oh, that didn't go very well. Uh, I take no for vitamins, but I wasn't going to, I don't want nobody don't want me, want me. So I moved on. Yeah. Uh, a week later, he sent me a note saying, oh my God, this went to my spam folder. <laughs> of course we'll do it. Thank God he checked the spam folder. $130 million commitment from them over 10 years to create a million new black business in America. And it's incredible, John. Part of the business plan. It's incredible. I, and, I, and, and here as we wrap up with the last 10 seconds, just, just tell for everybody in the audience. Where can we go to learn more about Million Black Businesses? And any quick hit closing thoughts? Again, about 10, 15 seconds here to wrap. I go wish we had up. more time. Go to hope1mbb.org or operationhope.org or go to Shopify's website or just check social media. And I just want everybody to know here, you can be the change that you want to see in the world. You don't have to sit around and, and scream at your TV set about how frustrated you are. You, you, everybody here wants to have a legacy. You don't want to just have, make a lot of money, to, to, to take your kids on vacation, uh, have a nice house and a nice car and die. You want the world to know you were here, which means about giving, not getting, living for something larger and more important to yourself. And, and if you have an opportunity to change history, I'm sure you would. You have that opportunity right now. You're living in it. And I'm sure you're going to do something with it. Please join 25 by 25. Thank you, John. And, and let's take it. We got to have you back. We want to hear more about what you're doing in the Million Black Businesses. We'll keep you posted on 25 by 25. Truly grateful to have you, John, and great to see you. Appreciate it. God bless you.